feel that your giving is being challenged or your life is being challenged in the area of giving? Anybody? Talk to me. Feel free to talk to me. Anybody? How many of you are learning something new? Praise the Lord. How many of you are not learning anything? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay. I want to say from the outset that we believe the Bible is our authority. We believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. We believe the Bible is truth. It is not a truth, it is the truth. We believe that when we study God's word, when we listen to God's word, when we receive God's word, we believe that we will actually understand the will of God and be able to do his will. And so as we are talking about these things, my prayer always has been that no one should misunderstand, including those who would uh, listen or watch these on social media, Facebook, YouTube, and whatever platform. The idea is not to teach you to become selfish or stingy, but the idea and, and the main point is that you will be liberated in your giving. Because the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. A giver who is not doing that. You see, when you are cheerful, it means you are happy. It means you are excited. It means that you are free and you are doing it. And, and you are doing something out of, you know, that freedom. Praise God. We, we should not be giving in bondage. We shouldn't be giving under duress. We shouldn't be giving under compulsion. The Bible even tells us that, and we'll see some of that today. Amen. So the idea is not saying that, well, keep everything for yourself, but for us to actually depart from the bondage of how people used to give in the Old Testament and begin to walk in the liberty of the freedom that the New Testament teaches. Amen. So we are trying to understand what the Bible says about giving so we can develop or cultivate the habit of giving. Now, Jesus has got many titles in Scripture. Lord, Savior, Master, Redeemer, and the Anointed One. But 60 times out of 90, 60 out of 90 times, I repeat, for the third time, 60 out of 90 times that various titles have been used, 60 out of 90 times, Jesus was called teacher. Amen. An example is John chapter 3, verse 1 to 3, where Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, called Jesus rabbi, which is the Jewish word for teacher. And he said, we know that you are a teacher come from God. So the Bible tells us, Jesus didn't go about calling himself a teacher. People called him a teacher. And it is even significant that Nicodemus, who is, the Bible said, he is a ruler of the synagogue. He is um, a man of authority. He is a public figure, or was a public figure. And he came to Jesus, and he called Jesus. I believe people call Nicodemus rabbi, but he came to Jesus and called him rabbi. And in fact, he qualified that title by saying that we. So that means Nicodemus being a ruler of the Jews, he was speaking, if you like, on behalf of the people under his authority. He says, we know. He didn't say we believe or we think. He said, we know that you, Jesus, are a teacher from God, which means that Jesus is not just any ordinary teacher. He's a teacher from God. He's divine. He's anointed. Hallelujah. Amen. And so we need to take it from that place that whatever Jesus is saying, then, then it has to be God. Amen? Amen. Now, a teacher is an instructor or an educator. We all know that, right? To educate people, you must have facts and information in order to instruct his or, um, you know, for a person to actually educate people or instruct people, you must have facts, you must have information 
so that you can in instruct your students accordingly. Now, Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7 covers a broad spectrum of topics including adultery, anger, righteousness, marriage, divorce, and giving. Praise the Lord. However, tithe, as we know it, is, is mentioned only three times in the whole of the New Testament. Three times. Twice by Jesus. The first one is in Matthew 23, verse 23. And then the second one is in Luke chapter 18, verse 10 to 14. The third one, the third mention of tithe in the New Testament, we find it in Hebrews chapter 7. Uh, Jesus talked. Uh, sorry, the writer of Hebrews talks so much about, uh, you know, he talked about tithes, especially when Mel Melchizedek received the tithe from Abraham. The point I want to make here is that the fact that Jesus, being a teacher, mentioned tithe only twice in the New Testament proves that he knew the requirements of the law. Amen. Because he did not ignore it, he mentioned it. Okay? He mentioned it. Um, for example, in Matthew 23, verse 23, Jesus said to the Pharisees, Woe to you, scribe and Pharisees, you tithe on uh, mint and cumin and, you know, on spices, but you neglect the weightier matter of the law. And then Luke chapter 18, Jesus told a story of a young uh, man and a Pharisee. They were praying in the temple, and the young uh, sinner prayed, and he beat his chest, and he said, Lord, have mercy on me. But the Pharisee was praying, and he said, Lord, I, I, I am not like this public, public person who is standing there. I, I, I pray a lot, and I fast, and I give tithe of everything I receive. Okay? So Jesus mentioning tithe meant that he knew about tithe. Praise the Lord. Therefore knew what the Old Testament Requires, For example, Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 26. Deuteronomy 27 verse 26. I want us to look at this. It will be up on the screen for us in a moment. Deuteronomy 27 and verse 26. If we can look at it in the New King James or any good version, that's fine. Deuteronomy 26, 27, 26. Old Testament. The Bible says, all right, it's up on the screen. Shall we all read it? Ready? Read. Again, curse is anyone who does not Okay, in the NIV it says, Curse is anyone who does not uphold the words of this law by carrying them out. Then all the people shall say, Amen. Now, Amen <laughs> is a very powerful word. One day I'm going to take my time and actually do a sermon on the word Amen. amen. So that you don't go about saying Amen to anything. <laughs> Because if you understand the roots of amen, my friend, it's not, amen is not a punctuation word. It's not a full stop. You know, and Satan destroyed that woman's life and people say amen. amen. <laughs> okay? But amen here, let's just touch the surface. Amen here means I agree. Or it is so. Or let it be so. And the Bible says that Deuteronomy, as they were reading out these instructions to the people, anything that is read, the people respond and say, Amen, I agree. Let it be so. So it says that, Cursed is anyone who does not uphold the words of this law by carrying them out. Then all the people shall say, Amen. In other words, they are agreeing that if they don't obey the law of Moses, then a curse should come upon them. Right? Now, last week, 
We were looking at Malachi only, and we saw that Malachi said to the people that you have robbed me, all you, this nation, the priest and the people, all together. And he said, you are cursed with a curse. Malachi was not just cursing them, he was referring to this particular portion. Because your forefathers agreed long time ago before you showed up that if they don't adhere to the teachings of the law and they don't practice the law, they should be cursed. So when they were not tithing, they started receiving what they themselves have agreed to with their mouth. Amen. So Malachi was not coming out of the blue and said, because you are not giving tithe, there's a curse upon you. Uh, do you get that? Okay, I know some of you are shocked. Oh. Now, now. <laughs> There's a general principle in the, in the law of Moses. And the general principle is this. You will find that in Deuteronomy 28. All right? There was about uh, 15 or so verses of blessing and about... 30 verses of curses. And it is all based on obedience or disobedience to the law. Flowing from this particular verse, Deuteronomy 27, 26. So generally speaking, the general principle under the law of Moses is that blessings follow those who obey and curses follow those who disobey. So as we saw last week in the book of Malachi, the nation of Israel and especially the priests were under a curse for not fulfilling their obligation under the law. This is something they agreed to. It's a bit like a contract. When you sign a contract and you don't read the small print, later on, if you break that contract or you go against it, the small print will begin to speak against you. It was there before you signed it. But it will not come into force until you do something contrary to what the contract says. You understand this? So when you have said, Amen, I will obey the law, and you fail at one point, then the curse, the corresponding curse, that relates to the very thing you have failed in will automatically come upon you. But thank God for Jesus. Amen. Now, when we look at giving in the New Testament, it is interesting. Because these strict obligations was what was upon, oh, help me, Holy Spirit. Pray for me, guys. Scriptures are just flooding into my mind like, a, whoo, help me, Lord. Remember in Acts chapter 15, when, when the Gentiles were coming to Christ, you know, and, and uh, some Jewish uh, Christians were telling the Gentiles that you, you are not really born again until you circumcised. And, and the news came to Jerusalem, to the apostles there. One of the things they said was that, remember that, you know, this law that was given, even our forefathers could not bear it. So let us not put any more burden on these ones. The law wasn't easy. But the Bible says that, let me not go ahead of myself. The law wasn't easy. So when we come to the New Testament, giving under the New Covenant, the New Testament is also the New, uh, new Covenant, right? Giving under the New Covenant, however, when we come to the New Testament, the story is a little different. I want to quote from a gentleman called Brent McDonald. He has written a book titled, Set Free to Give. I like the title. Set Free to Give. And here is what Brent McDonald says. One of the amazing, and I quote, one of the amazing changes in the new covenant is the unconditional nature of the blessing God now gives his people. The apostle Paul makes it clear that all believers are recipients of the spiritual blessings once only available to the Jews. And you will find that in Romans 15 verse 27. We don't need to look at it, just write it down. As for curses, 
when it comes to the New Testament, please listen to this carefully. When it comes to the New Testament, as for curses, the only people now found to be under a spiritual curse are unbelievers. Did you hear that? You didn't get that. I want it to soak in. The only people, as the New Testament teaches, who are under a spiritual curse right now as we speak are not Christians or those who have been born again or those who have accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, but those who have not believed, those who have rejected Jesus, unbelievers. The Bible says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22. Please put it up on the screen for us so that they know that it's not William who is saying it, but this is something that God's word says. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22. We are still in the quote. I have not finished the quote, but I want you to see this scripture, then we move on. What does it say? Read it for me. 1 Corinthians 16, 22. Guy, wake up, please. We flow with me. Sorry? Don't read anything I didn't say. <laughs> I want all of you to read it again. Did you see that? What does it say? Anyone who doesn't love the law. Those people who will sit on TV and social media. I'm an atheist. I renounce my faith. I literally inviting the curse. I, don't, I didn't say it. This is written. Somebody say it is written. Did you see it? So as we speak, anyone in the New Testament, anyone who is under a curse, this is a general principle, are unbelievers, not believers. Why? Let's move on. Brett McDonald's continues. Notice the unconditional nature of the blessing God has given us in Christ. And that's Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. And he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. God has unconditionally told believers that there is nothing that can any longer condemn them once they have been set free from the deeds and the curses of the law. So Romans chapter 8 verse 1 to 4 says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the, who is me? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus set who free? Me. Set who free? Me. Set who free? Me. Are you free? Yes. Okay, let's move on. Set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man, to be seen to be a sin offering and so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the spirit end of quote again galatians chapter 5 verse 1 I want to read this from the New Living Translation because I love it. And it says this. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get, don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. The New King James said it was for freedom that Christ set us free. No longer to be subject to the yoke of slavery. Somebody shout I'm free. 
And so when somebody pulls out Malachi chapter 3 and says that you have robbed God, that there is a curse upon you, please don't say anything. Just quote Romans chapter 8 verse 1 to 4 to that person. And if they don't accept it, repeat uh, Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. The Bible says, so Christ has set us free. And my Bible, as far as I'm concerned, it has not been erased. My Bible says that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Are you here? We are free. Hallelujah. So, let's look at what Jesus taught about giving. Now, now we, are going to, we are going to unpack. <laughs> hey, hey, stay with me. Focus. We, we are going to begin to unpack the scriptures because, listen to me, God wants you to be free so that you can be free to be generous and stop playing this hide and seek with pastors mm. or with churches. Praise the Lord. Some of you, every time you get your pay, you know, and, and, and then and you know you have to tithe, let's be honest. How many of you go, yippee, it's time to tithe? Yeah, very few. Because you're thinking, oh my God, mm. it's a lot of money. Yeah, I know. That's because we are not free. I have been taught this thing and I've worked in this thing for years. But like, I, like I'm telling you now, I want to practice my giving and I still do. But even in tithing, I want to tithe as a New Testament believer, not because somebody is carrying me that there's a curse upon me. Because the scripture says that Christ has set us free from the yoke of slavery. Praise the Lord. So Jesus talked more about money than anything else in the New Testament. His teaching in Matthew chapter 5, 6, 7. We've talked about covered a broad spectrum of subjects, including righteousness, uh, reconciliation, adultery, divorce, and giving. Now, let's look at some of the basic things Jesus taught about giving. First thing he taught about, one of the first things he taught about giving, charitable, doing charitable deeds. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 to 4, I will be reading it from the New King James Version. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 to 4, Jesus said, take heed, which means listen, take heed, that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So this is saying that don't do your charitable deeds. What is charitable deeds? Don't do your good words. Don't, don't good works. Don't do your benevolence publicly. Amen. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Wow. Wow. My friend. The left hand and the right hand, they coordinate. One cannot do without the other. But Jesus said, when it comes to charitable deeds, your secrecy should be to the point that even your left hand doesn't know what your right hand is doing. It is only in that that you can say, okay, this one, right hand is not going to coordinate with the left are you following this? That your charitable deeds may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Will reward you. You see, your deeds, charitable deeds should be in secret. But the God who sees in secret, he will reward you openly. Hallelujah. Amen. The second thing Jesus taught, which is a very interesting general principle in the New Testament when it comes to giving. Luke 6.38, we all know this. It says, give. Give what? Huh? Talk to me, church. I know. They say when you talk about giving, the church is quiet. 
Jesus said, give. Give what? Anything. Okay. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaking together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. If you give with a teaspoon, you will be given, according to Jesus, the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So if you give with a teaspoon, teaspoon will be measured back to you, pressed down, shaking together, running over. <laughs> In the teaspoon. Are you getting something out of this? So if you are rejoicing, I'm glad pastor is teaching these things. No, now I can keep my tithes and stuff like that. Well, the measure you use, it, it, it will be measured back to you. Third thing, I've mentioned this several times. Jesus also talked about the widow's might in Mark chapter 12, verse 41 to 44. And, and I just want to, I, I won't spend too much time. I just want to point something out to you. In Mark 12, 41 to 44, Jesus said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow, this is after Jesus observed people who were giving. Like I was observing those who were giving this morning. I'm only trying to follow Jesus. Amen. So in that case, next time I'll make sure pastor is not looking. No, no, don't worry. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this Poor widow. Pay attention to the words, please. This what? Poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. Why? They all gave out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in everything. All she had to live on. What is that? Out of her poverty, she put in everything, all she had to live on. Pastor, are you saying we should give everything we have in the offering? Are you a widow? <laughs> are you poor? That's not what we are saying. But this woman, Jesus, singled her out because she did something that touched God. Her giving spoke of the fact that one, though she was a poor widow, her giving everything she had to live on. This widow who was poor, because in those days they didn't have social services where you could go and uh, to the bank and withdraw money that the government has give you, given you because, uh, you know, or even collect her pension. In those days, women were very much dependent on their husband, who is the breadwinner. So if the man dies, then, you know, the care of the widow falls to the son. If the son dies, then that's it. The widow is done out. She is then reduced. <laughs> yeah, this teenage language, right? <laughs> Then the widow is reduced to slavery. She has to go and, and serve, wash people's feet and stuff like that so she can get what she can eat. Now, this widow caught Jesus' attention because the only person who has every right and every excuse under the sun to keep her last penny that she had to live on, she came and gave it in the offering. In other words, she's saying like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, oh king, we will not listen to you because our God will deliver. Even if he does not deliver, we will not bow. Mm -hmm. This widow came forward and he said, if I perish, I perish. But I love God so much. And I know this God, he won't disappoint me. Yeah. So she put him her all. That's all she could afford. She didn't hold back from God. And Jesus cited her as an example. Jesus cited her as an example. So there is no excuse for people saying that, Pastor, things are tough. I've got so much 
bills to pay and, uh, you know, I can't afford to give offering and stuff like that. My friend, learn from this widow who gave her everything. So her gift was 100%. You see, your gift can be 100%, not because you gave everything that came in your, in your pay packet. Your gift can be more than 100% if you gave it with everything that is in your heart. That's what God is looking at. That's what God is looking at. Hallelujah. So the widow's might, contrary to what many people think the widow's might was, her 100%. She gave all she had to live on. Jesus commended her. So what is the new, why is the New Testament, this is, a, this is a multi-million pound question, and I hope it will help somebody on social media. God bless you for tuning in. So why is the New Testament silent on tithing? Why is the New Testament very silent on tithing? I mentioned earlier that tithe is mentioned only three times. Jesus mentioned it twice. And then the third one, we find it in Hebrews chapter 7. He said, Pastor, you are destroying tithe. Oh, no, no. We are trying to restore giving. Amen. Praise the Lord. Why is the New Testament silent on tithing? One. Because Christ fulfilled perfectly and permanently all the righteous requirements of the law on our behalf. Galatians chapter 3 verse 3 is there. Number two, perfection could not be attained through the Levitical priesthood. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 11 tells us that. The law was imperfect. Number three, Christ became the curse for us, so we are free forever to do good. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. And number four, the apostles in the New Testament, they received gifts given to them. And they took offering for the poor. But they did not, you will never find anywhere in the New Testament where the apostles or even their disciples actually specified a certain amount that they had to give. Because if they could do that, then the tithe, the 10%, would have been the best measure. Because it has already been set under the law. But remember, these people were not under the law. They were under grace. And so the amount was unspecified. That means according to your ability, anything you can give, you give. But it must be honest. It must be truthful. It must be in accordance with what you have coming in. That's why I told you that the giving in the New Testament is even harder under the law, uh, harder than under the law. Because under the law, you know that whatever happens, you, you know you have to give ten percent and you're fine. Praise the Lord. So, for example, you earn, you earn your salary, all right. Let's say your salary is a thousand pounds. You earn that thousand pounds, and, and, and some good friend of yours also came and blessed you with five hundred. Now you have thousand five. You give according to thousand five, not according to your thousand. How much do you want to give out of that? We can't specify. See, so sometimes to help myself, what I do is I still tithe, but I don't tithe the ten percent now. I tithe more than the ten percent. I give. More than the 10%. Okay, I'm calling it tithe, but I give more than the 10%. Praise the Lord. That's according to my faith. Amen? I'm believing God to get to a certain point in my life. To get to a certain level of generosity. So I'm, I'm learning to increase my tithe every year. Praise the Lord. Oh, you did it like that. I'm not saying you should do it. I'm saying that's what I'm doing. So brothers and sisters, with all that I have said... What should be our motivation for giving? First of all, Jesus was a teacher, and he only mentioned tithing twice. Out of the three times that tithing was mentioned in the Old Testament. We can see in the New Testament that they didn't practice tithing like they were doing in the Old Testament, but they were generous givers. And next week we'll see how they actually gave in the New Testament. It will amaze you. You see, what I'm saying here is that, for example, 
if we don't understand the grace of God and the grace of God is not working in our life, you'll be a stingy person. You will always take advantage of what I have said. So pastor said that the tithe, in fact, we don't have to pay tithe in the New Testament. So every time, although you can afford to give a hundred pounds, you can afford to give 200, 300, even a thousand pounds, you come here and you put five pounds in the offering. Um, you remember the scripture I quoted earlier? He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. But Jesus said the same measure that you, you measured out will be measured back to you. So that way you're not teaching anybody. I am, trust me, I am not here to tell you something so to cheat so you can enrich me or anything like that. That is not the point. The point is that like myself, I believe you want to be free in your giving to know that what you are doing, it's honorable to God. Praise the Lord. I mean, this thing has been so out of balance that if, let's say, somebody, somebody's children is hungry and they are starving and a pastor comes around and he says that, you know, the Bible taught that Elijah said to the widow that, you know, bake, bake the cake for me first. So sow a seed into my life with everything you have and God will bless you. They will give it to the man of God. <laughs> Thank you, sweetheart. They'll give it to the man. They'll say, here, I'm sowing a seed. And your children are hungry. Unless God has actually spoken to you and has revealed to you and you have the strong conviction that that is the key to your breakthrough, my friend, don't do it. Because you and your children will go hungry. Remember when God spoke to Elijah, there is something we miss. That preachers who use that to take money from people, they miss it. God told Elijah that I have prepared a widow. I have what? Uh, he said, I have prepared a So by the time Elijah got there, God's spirit and God's grace was already working on the widow. If that is not your case, don't give it to them. Thank you. So our motivation when it comes to giving should no longer be of fear and compulsion, but solely out of love and gratitude. This alone is a good reason for us to be generous in giving. I heard a story about an old preacher in this country who was a very strict preacher. And one day he was, you know, beautifully dressed. In those days, the era of Queen Victoria, they used to jail teenagers, you know. When you are like a teenager, you can go to prison. And there was this teenager who has just been released from prison. And this teenager was so excited that he has been set free from prison that he was running and turning cartwheels on the sidewalk. And he bumped into the preacher. And the preacher caught him and smacked him. And the boy looked around and he said, Preacher, if you have been truly free, you will do exactly what I'm doing and even more. Mm. You don't get the point. The preacher was too strict. This guy has been set free. So he's enjoying his freedom. Tell you. And somebody was beating him for being free. Sometimes that is what happens to us. We get beaten for being free. Sometimes we get beaten because we have faith. Because we are believing God. Don't tolerate that. Galatians, and I'll finish with this, then we pray. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 to 10. I want to read this loudly from the New International Version, the NIV. Love this version. It says, do not be deceived. Do not be what? Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary. That word means tired, like really tired, bored. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. 
Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Did you see that? The Bible says, do not be what? Do not be deceived. Don't be deceived. That's verse 7. God cannot be mocked. If you are playing hide and seek with the church, my friend, you are mocking God. The Bible says God cannot be mocked. Give according to your ability. Like I said, it's not by force. When I say by force, I'm not saying don't give, but I'm saying that it shouldn't be by compulsion. Amen. Give because you believe you are a generous person. You believe you are a child of God and give it. God blesses that. It's a cheerful giving. Amen. Has somebody received something this morning? Listen, Christ has set us free. No longer to be subject to the yoke of slavery. Some of these things that I'm teaching, I don't know, maybe I will, I will get a few words uh, on social media, but that's fine. Because for some people, I'm spoiling their market, I know. But it's not intentional. We just want to teach the truth. I want to, you say, ah, we don't have our own church building. Pastor, why are you saying this? Because that's the way we are going to get our church building. By becoming free people, by becoming people who are generous in our giving. I am so touched to see young people in the church, teenagers sometimes, they, they are working and then sometimes you see them standing by the card machine, they want to give their offering. God bless you. Our Sunday school, I, I, I mean, I'm almost amazed and how I wish sometimes I even take a video of them. You know, there are two guys in Sunday school that, I mean, they are giving really, really, really touches me. One is Oraku. <laughs> and the second one is uh, James. Is it James? Daniel. I mean, the other time he came, he had his offering and he got to the bowl and he did some style and put the offering. I was like, wow, cheerful giver. <laughs> you know. And you see Oraku coming, he's marching, he gets there and he kind of like, you know, and put it in and he walks out. I say, wow, I love these guys, man. They've got it. Praise the Lord. We must learn to be what? Cheerful givers. Because the Bible says that a generous soul will be watered. A generous soul will be watered. A person who is generous. They never lack anything. That's right. I told you, one man of God, they interviewed him in Nigeria. And, and, and they asked him, are you a rich man? And he said to the interviewer, it depends on what you are asking. He said, I mean, you know, in terms of money, do you have a lot of money? And he said, listen, I can't tell you whether I am rich in dollars or naira or whatever it is. But my wealth is in this manner. That if I open my mouth and I say I need a shoe, my size will run out in Nigeria. Not Lagos, Nigeria. His size will run out. Which means he's got this thing that economists call social capital. You see, social capital is where you are connected to so many people and friends who are willing to do anything for you. Not because you are stingy and rude and selfish, but because you have been generous and loving and carefree and sacrificial. So they give back to you. The good measure president shaking together, running over. Yesterday, we attended um, a couple's 25th wedding anniversary. And, and, and this couple, if I listen to the words, the adjectives they were using to describe them, generous, sacrificial, selfless, loving, um, um, faithful, and so on and so forth. And I'm like, wow. Wow. You know them. They've been in this church before. Sir Jerry was there as well. But Adi and his wife. Any time you call them, they will show up for you. Talk about faithfulness. They are there. And the sort of people who showed up, including pastors, I was amazed. You see, that's the way the church ought to be. Where you are so blessed that if you lie down and you say, my head, your house will be flooded with paracetamol and all kinds of painkillers plus prayers. Mm. Mm. 
So you choose your choice, whether you go for divine healing or you go for medical healing. But, but there are people who will come to you with liquid paracetamol, solid paracetamol, air paracetamol. <laughs> we, we will bring all the gas paracetamol. We will bring every kind of medicine. We will run around you. Praise the Lord. That's where God wants us to come to. This is how the early church eradicated poverty from their midst. But in our day and age, the people are so self-centered. Mm. And it's all about me. Because we are being told that God wants to prosper and bless you. So you can have the nice car, the nice wife, a big house, tennis court, swimming pool, and what else? A private jet for good measure. So you can travel in style. The other day, Benahin asked on social media, he said, have you ever met somebody who has received the hundredfold before? How many? He said, very few people. Mm. Why is it that? Why is that? No, God does bless people with a hundredfold, but how many people have received it? Rise up, let's pray. God is not a liar. When God says he will receive a